this uh, Leap Texas webinar today. Uh, we're going to be looking at um, assessment of core curriculum assignments and specifically looking at assessment in terms of the Texas Assessment Collaborative. Hopefully uh, you have uh, some idea of what the Texas Assessment Collaborative is. If not, you can check out the information on the Leap Texas website and we'll give you that link later on. Um, we'll also be talking about some general aspects of uh, designing assignments and we have a couple of guest speakers that are going to participate today to tell us about their experiences with the uh, Niola charrette that was recently held in New Orleans and share some things they've gleaned from that experience. Uh, our general uh, presenters today are Chris Duke and Chris is from San Jacinto College. He's the director of curric uh, curriculum and assessment there and then I am Larry King. I am the Director of Student Learning and Institutional Assessment at Stephen F. Austin State University. Uh, just some information as we get ready to do the um, webinar. You should be able to see on the right side of your screen a box with information about the GoToMeeting in it. Uh, you will notice at the bottom, toward the bottom of it, there's a place for chat. We will have an opportunity for um, answering questions, and you can type your question in there. Uh, everyone is probably muted at this point. Uh, we will be unmuting some folks as we go through the webinar to, um, to do some presentations. But uh, by and large, most folks will stay muted. If you have a question while we're going through the webinar, please type it in the box down there, and we'll try to answer those as we can get to them. You will see here the link to uh, Leap Texas and the uh, development hub at Leap, Leap Texas. Uh, also, during the webinar and or at any other time, if you want to uh, tweet about the webinar or any uh, information that you may come across that you think would be valuable to any of us in Leap Texas, you may uh, do that using our uh, Twitter handles there. After this webinar, uh, the recording of it will be posted on the Leap Texas website. And also, uh, there are blogs available for you to continue uh, conversation about this. And you're also certainly free to contact Chris or I as well. Today in the webinar, we're going to take uh, two perspectives. We're going to be looking at the Texas Assessment Collaborative focusing on uh, written communication, uh, the project that we'll be working on uh, over the next uh, couple of years. And then we're also going to be looking at designing um, assignments for assessment of core uh, curriculum courses uh, using the LEAP value rubrics. Also, we're going to be having three segments uh, through this webinar. Um, we're going to be looking at the uh, parameters that we are uh, going to be using for the Texas Assessment Collaborative, uh, how the assignments need to be structured and how they need to be uh, presented. Uh, also, we'll be talking about, uh, well, a couple of the folks that participated in the uh, charrettes in New Orleans are going to be talking about what they gleaned from that experience. And then we're going to be talking about uh, strategies for adapting existing assignments uh, for use with the LEAP value rubrics for assessment. Okay, so looking at assignment design, uh, from kind of a general perspective, uh, you really kind of want to do this backwards design where you start with the outcome and then work from there to determine, you know, given the outcome that we're looking at, uh, what sort of an assessment method or an assessment instrument do we need uh, to determine whether or not students have attained that outcome? And with that assessment instrument developed, you can then move forward into designing the assignment so that you're eliciting a response 
from the student that expects them to perform in ways that the assessment instrument has defined. Now, in terms of um, this first section, we want to look at this process from the perspective of the Texas Assessment Collaborative Project that Larry and I are working on. And just briefly, uh, that project over the next year, uh, we're going to be working with hopefully eight community colleges or four community colleges and four um, universities within Texas to collaboratively collect samples of student work to assess against the LEAP rubrics, which are mapped to the Texas core objectives. And as we do that, we've got to find a kind of some sort of common ground around the assignments that so that they're aligned to the rubric that we're going to be accessing against. Now, given that project, uh, we already have some elements of this defined. Um, the first piece is that the outcome that we know that we're focusing on is the written portion of the Texas Core Objective for Communication. Following from that, uh, because we're a leap Texas, uh, a leap state, and we're working within that construct, uh, we will be working from the value rubric for written communication. So then that gets us to the point where we need to look at the assignments that the institutions participating in that project will be collecting um, that are mapped so that those are aligned to that value rubric for written communication. So in terms of uh, one of the things that we're going to talk about now is some of the specific parameters around assignments um, that we may need in order to um, elicit the response uh, for, for students through all these different assignments. In the last section of, of the webinar, we're going to start talking about specific tools that could be applied for any assignment in any outcome uh, in any rubric. So when you start looking at that uh, assessment method and looking at that rubric and to develop that assignment, the first step is to go back to that rubric and, and spend some time with it, analyzing and understanding uh, each of the criteria, and it's an extremely important process um, for faculty to, to engage because even locally as we've engaged this process at San Jack over the last four to five years, uh, if, if you look at it just kind of one time and then you start designing the assignment, there, it's very, very easy to get away from um, some of the specifications within those different levels um, of each criteria. So we think content development, we start designing the assignment, you've got to keep in mind that not just what content development is a general construct or how you may conceive of what that is, but analyze the rubric and pay very close attention to how does the rubric define each level of performance for content development. Now, for, for this project, what we need to do is kind of define loose parameters around the kinds of assignments that the institutions participating in the assessment collaborative will want to collect. Now, a few notes is that keep in mind we are working at a state multi-institutional level. So the kind of parameters that we're going to be defining are going to be very minimum parameters that are necessary in order to meet the requirements for that written communication rubric. The second thing is the parameters that we're going to talk about are an initial draft parameters. Kind of the role that Larry and I are taking with this project is that we're doing a lot of the groundwork and research to find out, kind of give us an initial starting point. And then our expectation is that the institutions that opt to participate in the project will have input into shaping and forming these. So keep in mind that these are not written in stone. These are kind of a first pass. They're based on our respective institutional experiences, but then also the work that we're watching being done by the multi-state collaborative um, up in the Northeast. The final thing is that as we're going through these parameters, these parameters are mostly agnostic to content in this case, because we are talking about parameters around what's necessary to assess uh, written communication against that LEAP value rubric. And so it's very possible to take some of these parameters and apply them at an institutional level, because the parameters are enough information. And, and essentially what uh, we have a number of uh, areas within our core curriculum where our departments and our faculty working together to look at the types of assignments uh, to be used for general education outcomes assessment where they have only defined parameters and the, the specific content or the specific topics um, are unspecified because then that allows, um, it basically keeps, it minimizes the amount of information that's being, you know, kind of asked or required of faculty. 
So looking at the parameters for uh, the types of assignments that would be needed to, for us to assess student work against the written communication rubric. Uh, in terms of the format, the first, of course, is that it needs to be written. It's written communication. Uh, but one of the things around that is the kind of the expected document formats um, that, that we would might expect. And that would, of course, be kind of your Word documents, maybe general word, uh, pr word processing documents like the rich text format, format the, the RTF. Uh, maybe some of those saved as PDFs, or even in some cases, uh, just plain text files. The, it, that would exclude um, other types of formats, including uh, scan documents or scan multiple choice exams, or perhaps other modalities or formats um, for like uh, JPEGs or GIFs or images or PowerPoints or things like that that may constrain, um, constrain what, how the student is writing or how much written information they may provide. And then some of it, too, may be a logistical issue for the evaluators, and this is thinking farther down the road, is that um, oftentimes we have, um, there, there may be needs or times where we need to check um, and look at what a student's written and do a quick search and stuff. And if that's in a JPEG or a GIF or a static format where we can't kind of get to the text and copy and paste, it may inhibit some of the things that our evaluators might want to be able to do as they're assessing a student document. Um, the last thing is, and again, this is a, a kind of a focus on what we'll be asking the participating institutions to do around this project, is that we will be looking for typewritten work uh, rather than scanned handwriting. Uh, it's just there's a lot of complications when you get into um, trying to scan documents and scanning them into, into JPEGs or GIFs and how visible and readable they are whenever they reach the evaluators. Now, turning to the rubric itself in looking at that criteria around content development um, generally we're going to start in terms of a length of assignment that we're going to be looking for is a minimum of 750 words or roughly three pages up to a maximum of 2500 words or roughly 10 pages uh, the reason for that is an initial idea that if students are going to demonstrate um, their ability to develop content, they, that's probably going to require a, a minimum number of, of pages. Uh, there's two things that uh, kind of inform that. Uh, one is we've seen this type of parameter from the multi-state collaborative. So as they have assessed, I think last year, and I know they're assessing written communication this year, this is one of the requirements that they ask for the types of assignments that are submitted to that collaborative project um, because it, it, it helps ensure that there's enough writing there for evaluators to assess. That's the first thing that informs it and suggests that this it would be useful and helpful in, in listing that type of response. The second thing is that some of our institutional experiences, I know at San Jacinto College, uh, we, we started out around the written communication, the parameter that there needed to be enough writing for appropriate development. And that's the only thing that we specified because there's this very careful line that we're trying to navigate is that we do need to specify parameters so that we can assess against these rubrics because if you don't ask the right questions and you don't ask students to do things, then they don't necessarily do them. And so we need to specify those parameters, but we don't want to ask too much or specify too much. So when we started out, we, that's all we said was that we just, there needs to be enough writing for appropriate development. Well, as we started get, doing the assessment, we started getting back um, certain assignments, some assignments from some faculty that were a page or less. And our faculty evaluators response to that was that there is just not enough material there for me to determine adequately whether or not the student can develop content. Um, the content typically wasn't developed well enough, but our evaluators said that in, in evaluating that student work, they weren't certain if that one page, if the student given the opportunity or being asked to write three pages, if they'd be able to develop content or not. And they felt that if students had been asked to write three pages, that they would have a more reliable assessment of that individual student's ability to develop content. And so that's kind of where these parameters are coming from, again, from kind of our the things that we've observed within the multi-state collaborative, but then also um, some of our institutional experiences. 
The second thing around content development is revisions. Uh, I know that uh, we've had a lot of local conversations around this. It's like, well, if they're revising it or if they're peer revising it and, and getting input and feedback from others to improve the writing, is that something that you want to see? Um, or do you just want to see an absolute final, the, just this is their attempt and their attempt only? And the response to that is that, look, there is a writing process that occurs, and that may often include peer review, peer revisions, or things of that nature. But ultimately, that final product, that final version um, that we're expecting to be submitted, even though there may have been help for the student along the way, it's still that student's adaptation and use of that writing process and that feedback to develop that. Um, and we'll talk a little bit in about authorship and the difference between you know, a student going through a writing process, which, you know, has multiple drafts, some of which may have had um, peer reviews or others, you know, there were even writing centers helping them, and the difference between that and, you know, a team developed or a jointly written document. Now, looking at the writing conventions, the criteria from the rubric that focus on those, uh, one of the criteria does look at the sources and evidence so that when we are looking at the assign types of assignments that are collected uh, for this project, they, those assignments will need to require the use of sources and evidence, and this is a key phrase, appropriate to the discipline. Um, now, naturally, it, you start to, when you say sources and evidence, we often think in terms of in liberal arts and maybe your um, English composition paper where it's a research paper and they, they have found secondary sources. But, in terms of written communication, when you start applying that rubric across the entire core curriculum in Texas, especially given that that core objective is mapped to every course in the core, um, it means sources and evidence potentially means different things in different disciplines. And so if you're talking about primary sources in philosophy or history or other disciplines, um, or if you jump out into the, the math and science courses, um, math and science courses, those uses, those sources and evidence aren't necessarily going to be secondary sources. It may be students writing a lab report and referring to lab results because the lab results are sources and evidence within um, the sciences. And the same for calculations in math. Um, so yes, one, Good. Good. one Good. Watching example. Watching a webinar. Oh, that's exciting. Yeah. Um, And so when you're talking about sources and evidence over in math, one example of an assignment I've seen is that um, faculty in an algebra class had given students, uh, said, you know, here's, here's the formula for three, how the salaries are calculated at three different jobs. Um, complete the calculations and then make an argument as to which is the best job. Well, as the student interacts and, and starts writing uh, against that assignment, their sources and evidence, if they're not referring to their calculations in their writing, then they're not using sources and evidence appropriate to math as a discipline. The second thing around the writing conventions is very similar to that, and that starts looking at dis conventions that are specific to the discipline regarding organization development, um, how they're using or citing references. Um, locally, uh, we at San Jack, we have looked at, this is where we start incorporating uh, some of the discipline-specific methods for citing sources, whether you're talking about MLA or Chicago or, you know, and all the different versions, parentheticals and footnotes and stuff like that. But it's also when you have uh, written communication that's in a specific style or in a specific format, um, especially if you get over into fields with technical writing, uh, it would be good to have assignments that reflect and require those disciplinary conventions. So lab reports within the sciences and stuff, those have a very definitive kind of format and expectations within the discipline. And so requiring those things in this type of an assignment um, helps to attend to that, that criteria for disciplinary conventions. Um, that's opposed to trying to over-adapt and say, well, in the science class, I just want students to write, you know, a, a, a three-page essay. Well, that's not necessarily the writing that you always do in science. You typically do things that are more technical in nature. And it's okay and actually encouraged to do the things that are more technical in nature because that's the type of written communication that's appropriate to that discipline. 
the last criterion on the rubric is we start, remember, we're analyzing that rubric to consider what types of things we need to ask students to do in the assignments um, so that we can assess against this rubric. The last one is syntax and grammar. And the only comment there is that in some of the assignments in the various disciplines, especially those outside of um, maybe the liberal arts or especially the, the English communications, those English 1301 and 1302 courses, we may need to emphasize um, students uh, attending to their use of syntax and grammar. I know that, um, you know, I've seen mention of that through the multi-state collaborative, I believe, and then I also know that we have had a lot of conversations uh, locally around how much our math courses, our science courses, and um, it, are emphasizing the, the syntax and grammar in some of these written assignments. And uh, th those can be interesting conversations because a lot of times, it, sometimes you have students that start to think in silos and, well, I'm in my math class, so they're focusing on, I'm focusing on the calculations and I'm not really thinking about whether or not I'm writing very well. And so it may be, it may warrant and be beneficial for the assignments, especially those across the entire core and not just in the communications piece. Um, ask students to, um, uh, to pay attention to syntax and grammar as they're writing. Now, there are a few kind of logistical parameters um, that do affect the type of writing, the type of response that students will give to an assignment. Um, the first is the course context, is that when we have the, the types of assignments that we should be collecting for the assessment collaborative, the expectation is that we are talking about in, in the spirit of kind of the, the entire LEAP value project as a whole, not just within Texas, but we are talking about course embedded assessment and the benefit of when we're looking at um, how students are attaining general education outcomes that we're, we're analyzing that and looking at the evidence that comes out of the courses that in the assignments that students complete in those courses under the direction of faculty. Well, with that kind of underlying philosophy, a key part of the course context is that the assignments we're collecting are a regular graded part of a course. Um, and that's to distinguish it from courses that are assignments that are extra credit or bonus credit or things like that. Because what that will do um, is that, uh, well, we all know if, if it's not graded or students don't do optional, uh, and I don't really know what that phrase means because I don't really do optional. Um, you know, everyone has a time crunch. And so if, if the assignments are, extra credit or bonus credit, then that starts skewing the types of responses you're going to get from students. It's typically going to be your overachievers, which means we're only going to be getting the responses from our very best students. And so there is a, an expectation that it is a regular graded part of a course. The second kind of logistics is around authorship, and I alluded to this earlier. And that is because the question we're trying to answer is how well are our how well is our students able to attain the general education outcomes? Well, in order to answer that question properly, we need to be looking at independent work only. It needs to be work that's completed by an individual student and not samples from assignments that are completed by a team of students. And so, um, and I was, I was talking about this earlier. So if a student is going through the writing process uh, and they're getting at different points, they're getting feedback and, and input on different drafts, and then they're adapting to that, then that's still, that, that totality of that entire document is still their responsibility, and it's still their work. And that's distinguished from, say, uh, you know, if there's a lab report that uh, a group of students, if you've got three students working on the lab report, and, you know, you don't necessarily know how they divide it up, you just know that they all had a hand in writing it. Um, that's the distinct distinction. And what we're looking for specifically are individual assignments that are completed by individual students. The last logistical parameter, and I want to emphasize this one because uh, this is going to affect some of the workload that we'll have, participating institutions will have down the road, and that is around confidentiality and anonymity, is that the subject matter of the assignment should not identify the student, the faculty, or the institution. Um, this is one of the things that we, that Larry and I have gleaned from um, the work that the multi-state collaborative is doing and how they're handling the collection of student samples from multiple institutions. There's very clearly um, FERPA issues and IRB issues related to that. 
Well, one of the ways to address that is to make sure that any documents that we collect are completely anonymous. And so that um, the anonymous and confidential so that they're not identifying the student, the faculty, the institution. And so we, we can collect documents and, and remove any headers that they put that have that identifying information at the top pretty easily. But the MSC has also suggested that, look, that there should not be any identifying information within the body of the assignment either. So any, the, any of the types of assignments that would create a problem here would be if there's an assignment that's asking the student to reflect on their experience in a certain way, especially if it talks about their, their experience at the institution or with faculty or other students, then what that would do is that that would end up putting identifying information into the body of the paper. So those types of assignments, we need to pay attention to those, and those would preferably not be included in the sample that we'll be collecting for this project. And then we will talk a little bit more around the kind of parameters around assignment and analyzing assignments in the last section. And But now we have a couple of guest speakers. Okay, everyone. My name is Jennifer Edwards, and I'm from Tarleton State University. I am a faculty fellow, and I also serve as, as Assistant Vice President for Student Success and Multicultural Initiatives, and I'm very proud to serve as a faculty fellow for Lake Texas. I am attempting to share my screen, but um, with the uh, okay, so basically I will talk about the Nala Charette, and we were excited um, to submit a proposal, and our proposal was accepted to be part of that Nala Charette. Um, basically, okay, please let me know if you can see my screen. Yes. Awesome. So um, the Nala Charette um, is basically a and a charrette, we were told, is a small cart. And so it is um, a term utilized um, in France to represent an architectural um, student's journey in submitting their final um, proposal for review or their final product, project for review. So that was um, very exciting to present as part of the um, as part of Leap Texas. And we were, we're also excited to present with Dallas um, County Community College District as well. So um, we had five Leap Fellows present. We had Dr. Doyle Carter, and he is from Angelo State. We had Dr. Maureen Armo um, Cuevas. She is from Our Lady of the Lake University. We had me, of course. And then we also had Dr. Lana Jackson and um, Dr. Terry DePaulo. And so those are elite fellows and they all submitted um, proposals or as part of this joint proposal. Now the charrette submission, um, we submitted assignments that focused on the first year seminar. And so that was something that we all had in common. And as you can see, we um, all represent four year institutions, some public, some private, some two year institutions as well. And so um, this was a commonality amongst all of the Lee Texas fellows. And in our proposals, we had um, com commonalities with the learning outcomes, such as the intellectual skills, communication fluency, and applied and collaborative learning. And again, they were all focused on the first year experience and the first year seminar. So um, four of the assignments um, are highlighted. The first assignment was a career project and the first year seminar. And this career project actually utilized my plan, which is a career assessment, which is um, important for first year students to, to take this career assessment or another career assessment. Um, also, we had the assignment two, which is focused on information literacy and introduction to research and the first year seminar. And we also had being successful in college and all of the, as you can see, all of the assignments had rubrics associated with them. Um, one thing that was especially helpful is um, me as a Texas Leap Fellow, I was able to see um, the other assignments from other um, universities. And so sometimes we think that we're isolated at our university or, or at our college, but if we can see that other people are going through the same struggles that we are, especially teaching the first year seminar, then that would, is especially helpful for um, either new or seasoned faculty members. 
And moving on to assignment four, the liberal arts, and this was my assignment, the liberal and fine arts problem and solution approach, and it also had a rubric. So I will talk for a few moments about the, um, the liberal arts um, problem and solution approach. Our first year seminar is actually in um, our institutional op option section of our core. And so at Tarleton State, um, this is something that is taught in the respective academic college or in the academic department. And so the, I'm part of the College of Liberal and Fine Arts, and um, I worked with students ranging from music students to, um, to basically fine arts to English to criminal justice to communication. So it, and it, it basically um, touched every student who is part of liberal and fine arts. And so with this problem solution approach, I required the students to participate in um, research groups and they had to go to the library to receive instruction from one of the librarians as well as they had to get to know the databases. So they are very familiar with EBSCOhost and I still um, remain in contact with a, mo a majority of them to this day and so that was over um, two years ago and they're still enrolled which is a good thing. So here is um, the rubric that we utilized. This is um, also the rubric that I put as part or I included as part of the charette proposal for my piece. But um, basically, you had the background of the problem, you had the full explanation of the problem at Tarleton, you had the College of Liberal and Fine Arts Solution, or COLPA, you had the potential benefits and negative impacts of implementation, and then you had the informal responses. And so all of those um, were included on the rubric. And so the rubric ranged from, on a Likert scale, from did not attempt to exceed professors' expectations. And um, one thing that was especially helpful um, as part of the charrette is that we basically, um, we, were, we were part of a, a roundtable approach. And so each group um, in each university, and we were the only one, we were the only um, table that focused on a multi-university approach. So we were especially excited about that. But each person presented their assignment for um, about 10 minutes, 10 to 12 minutes. And then the individuals who were seated at the table at the end of your presentation, they had a chance to ask questions to you about your um, integration of this assignment in the course, about the context, about the students. So it was very eye-opening. And so um, this was a, I'll have to admit, this was one of the most, um, my most vulnerable points as a faculty member because um, usually people do not, um, you know, critique assignments that you give to students, but this was a great opportunity to critique and also to be critiqued. And so um, I had a high level of um, vulnerability. So um, with the charrette, we were also um, given four processing questions. And so each person had to write on a carbon copy form um, responses to the following questions. What were the main strengths of the assignment for assessing the specified DQP proficiencies? And the D DQP proficiencies, which I was excited to see that those coincide with our THECB, our Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board, and student learning outcomes for the core. Also, thinking, the second question is thinking about the assignment from the point of view of students. What questions or suggestions do you have for the presenter? The third question is what further information do you or would users of the library have about the assignment and its use? And what it mentions users of the library, users of, of the um, Nilo, Niloa um, assignment library. And also the other question is other suggestions and possibilities, especially in response to the author's questions about improving the assignment. And so um, we were taxed at the very end to take all of the responses that we received and to um, revise and resubmit our assignment, which is something you know very interesting for a faculty member to do, um, but whether seasoned or new, but it was a great way for us to reflect on the types of assignments that we're giving our students. So not only am I reflecting on the assignments for first year students, but also for um, my graduate students as well. So I plan to implement this approach for not only the first year, and I see um, Dr. Thompson is in here as well, and she's from Tarleton as well, so thank you for supporting today, but not only for the first year seminar faculty, but also talking with our Center for Instructional Innovation about potentially having a charrette approach for other faculty at the institution as well. Um, 
So that was the assignment. I did have some next steps as well. Um, I will revise and resubmit for the NALOA repository, as well as um, planning surrettes on our respective campuses, so Tarleton and the other Texas LEAP institutions. Um, and also, we are submitting a multi-group proposal for the National Communication Association Conference, and that was actually, I'm collaborating with another institution that was there, um, and they are all communication faculty, so they asked me if I wanted to present, and so I said sure, but we are presenting that as part of a pre-conference. So um, this lives on, and if you have any questions, just reach out to me. My name on Twitter is at, or my handle on Twitter is at DRJT Edwards, and I will be happy to provide um, contact information for the other Texas Loop Fellows, as well as any information that you have about my assignment. Thank you for the opportunity to present today. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, our next uh, participant in the uh, Niola Charettes that were held in uh, New Orleans is Karen Mongo. Karen? Can you unmute yourself? Okay, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, great. Uh, yes, I'm Karen Mongo. I am uh, serving as the Dean of Curriculum Assessment and Accreditation at El Central College, one of the colleges in the Dallas County Community College District. Our college had a team that also participated in the charrette. Our team was a multidisciplinary group. It included speech, sociology, history, and government. And we created an assignment with the topic of gun control. And the goal was that students would talk about the issue of gun control in a written communication assignment, uh, a standard five-paragraph assignment, and but it would be contextualized for each discipline or each course. And ultimately, the, the assignment will be administered across six different courses that will help us with the assessment of the core objectives here in Texas uh, for speech, uh, sociology 1301, history 1301, history 1302, government 2305, and government 2306. But what you have in front of you is just a PDF of the assignment that is used in public speaking to provide us with the framework for having this discussion. So with this, students were asked to, uh, it, it was explained in, in the overview, as you see, that students would actually um, increase their understanding of public speaking, uh, particularly persuasion, by asking them to analyze an argument using the modes of proof as talked about um, ethos, pathos, and logos. So when you get down to the assignment itself, students were told to review a PowerPoint, and the PowerPoint provides an overview of gun control. Uh, laws, obviously the First Amendment, uh, incidents like Columbine, for example, uh, Sandy Hook, uh, other incidents where gun uh, violence has occurred, uh, advocates for gun rights and those who are against uh, uh, gun ownership, for example, and particularly the right to carry uh, in public places. And <clears throat> the um, PowerPoint was uh, contributed by everyone who's a part of the, com the group uh, representing all disciplines. So it's to provide students with enough background information to be able to then move forward our thinking here is, and, and, and the term used by uh, those in the assessment circles, and particularly NILOA, is the term of scaffolding. And what that allows is for making sure that we uh, empower students to be successful. Part of what we believe is that as we attempt to assess, whether it's written communication or critical thinking, is that sometimes we're not really assessing students' critical thinking skills or written communication in this instance because they may be struggling to understand just what they've been asked to do uh, and, and also the content or the prompt. So we thought that if they are <clears throat> introduced to this information across multiple courses and, and, and once they understand that in, in these different uh, environments, 
from a rhetorical standpoint, from a sociological standpoint, from a historical standpoint, uh, from a federal standpoint. By the time students make it to uh, Texas government, government 2306, then definitely they'll have um, a lot of background knowledge and experience to be able to even better articulate uh, what they think about it as it relates to Texas law. So that's part of what we've attempted to do across the board here with this particular assignment is to kind of scaffold it and provide students or empower them to be more successful. Uh, the, the other part of that is you see the scaffolding occurring uh, even in the assignment that, that is on your screen right now because even though they're asked to write a five paragraph essay, we tell the student in paragraph one what we expect them to do. In paragraph two, this. Paragraph three, uh, pathos, emotional appeal, and, and including Maslow's hierarchy of needs might be part of that. Uh, the, third, the fourth paragraph, third main point, looking at uh, logos, uh, an appeal to logic and how that's done, and lo looking at the analysis of fallacies, if the Red Tour has committed uh, or, or presented any fallacies in an effort to uh, make the argument. And then uh, about the evidence used, uh, examining that, and also to refute counter arguments that um, if, if the Red Tour refutes the count any counter arguments to the view that uh, he is uh, presenting, in this case, both uh, persons happen to be male. And then finally, the fifth paragraph asking them to conclude, providing a, a summary. Um, one of the things that Niloa uh, commented about uh, with this um, approach was that they really enjoyed seeing the scaffolding approach across the courses, but also within the assignment itself. Because for us, we, we are an open door institution. Many of our students come underprepared. And so to ask them to simply write and expect them to know what we want from that uh, would, would probably not give us the results that we seek. We have had a number of conversations with folks about uh, how to do this. There are those that definitely believe that, well, you tell them to write, they should know how to do it. And if I'm doing too much, am I spoon feeding them? And um, the, the, our, our position ultimately is it's not spoon feeding, it's providing them with the tools in order to be successful. So we, we, we embraced the scaffolding approach, as you see. It's one of the things that uh, we were complimented for as we presented this information. And so that's part of how we present all of the assignments to the students, by asking, by telling them exactly what we hope to get. Uh, part of what uh, Chris mentioned earlier was uh, a minimum for the writing assignment. But we opted not to do a word count because what we got initially in assessment when we did word count was people making sure they had those words, not making sure that they really followed what we hope them to demonstrate in good writing. The organization having a clearly defined introduction, body with supporting evidence, a clear conclusion. And so we wanted to back off of, even though to some extent, we will definitely get a minimum when we talk about having well-developed uh, paragraphs and, and, and et cetera, and, and you see the request for research and, and documentation, for example, and sources. So we think that we'll get the minimum, but we, we decided not to do the word count because students will actually do word count, and they think that if they have those words that somehow they have met some degree of success. So we wanted to take the focus off of that and so we don't do a word count, but we do put in the criteria here that we hope that they would meet in terms of the organization, in terms of the support, in terms of the sources. Um, and in this case, students have access to the PowerPoint, uh, the textbook, of course, where these concepts are discussed. They have access to the speeches that they've been asked to review. And then they're asked to actually uh, cite three other sources, journals, newspapers, or magazines, and they cannot be Wikipedia or encyclopedias, um, and they're asked to use, a pr use primary sources for this. And uh, those were some of the things that we were in agreement on, uh, particularly because one of the learning outcomes for the history courses it has uh, specifically states uh, primary sources. If we look at the SLOs, 
in the ACGM. They talk about use of primary sources. And so we thought if we'd be consistent with that, students would get used to that. So by the time they take history or the government, then definitely they would it will be real clear what, what we mean by primary sources versus secondary sources, um, so on and so forth. And so that's the gist of what the assignment looks like. Um, and again, the feedback that we got was uh, an appreciation for uh, a really having a, a formulaic approach to the assignment design, also uh, uh, making sure we were attempting to scaffold the, the, the information for the students across courses and particularly within an assignment itself. So um, our goal is to further refine our work and uh, hopefully uh, fully implement this assessment in the fall semester. Thank you, Karen. We appreciate you sharing with us. All right. OK. Um, and so we want to turn and look in this last segment. And I want to be sure to try to leave at least five to seven minutes for questions at the end. Uh, is looking at uh, an assignment design strategy in, in terms of redesigning existing assignments for institutions that are looking to begin working with um, kind of LEAP-based assessment using the value rubrics. Uh, and again, kind of going back to that intentional design I mentioned at the outset is that, you know, starting with the outcome and moving to the assessment instrument and then to the assignment, again, it, it doesn't matter which institution um, in the state that we're talking about, you, we have some of those things defined. We have the Texas core objectives that define those outcomes. Um, if you are or looking to begin assessing against the value rubrics, then the focus of the conversation at, that, at, these, at your institution is going to be on that section, is, and that is that intersection between the value rubric and the assignment. And so in looking back, um, San Jacinto College, we've been doing kind of the LEAP-based assessment. I think we're in our fourth or fifth year. And we've started looking at, at a tool that I think that it's one of those things that if we had known then what we know now, um, it would have been extremely helpful in moving us along in this LEAP-based assessment. And so going back to the idea of analyzing the rubric, how do we focus within that, that alignment? Uh, and the beauty of this is that in using LEAP-based assessments, we don't have to recreate the wheel. We don't have to create something new. We have written communication assignments across the core. The question is, is that are, are those written assignments structured such that it's eliciting a response from students so that they're performing in a way that the LEAP value rubric expects? And so one of the tools that we're looking at doing in using is we're referring to it as an alignment worksheet. And it's not anything complex. It's very simple, very straightforward. It's essentially a one-page document, or it starts out at that at least. And that is um, taking the assignment and taking the rubric. And any faculty in any course in any area of the core can do this. And that is take the, the rubric and the assignment side by side. And then with this alignment worksheet, Analyze the assignment. Describe how does the assignment require the student to attend to context of and purpose for writing. Now, one of the things that I mentioned earlier that's extremely important as faculty are doing this is to pay attention to all four levels of and analyze all four levels of that criterion. Um, we have had instances where, um, you know, faculty, when they've looked at context of of and purpose for writing or content develop, may, they may be focused on level two or level three. And we've had some faculty in our focus groups have commented, say, well, you know, our assignments are aligned pretty well, but some of the things that we're asking them are maybe not quite expecting enough. We're not really asking them to do as much as they possibly could so that maybe the assignment inhibits the student, that it asks the questions in a way that the student at best is going to perform at a level two or at best is going to perform at a level three, where is if we take and go through this process of looking at the assignment and comparing it to all different levels of each criterion and, des and describing in this worksheet exactly how the assignment expects the student to perform, then it might start opening up some things in, for students to, to perform better uh, against the leap value rubrics on that particular assignment. And again, it's not anything very sophisticated or complex. It's just one of those things that 
again, if we had known then what we know now, um, this tool, providing this tool to faculty at the outset of trying to adapt existing assignments to the rubrics probably would have improved um, our alignment between the assignment and the rubric um, a great deal. And of course, it's a little bit longer document. This is this is the actual full text of the document that we're uh, beginning to use around written communication. Um, you know, we have groups of faculty that are working for, um, you know, that teach a particular course that are working together on an assignment. And so we have them copy the assignment at the top and then they can collaboratively work on the document to consider how the assignment addresses each of the criterion uh, on the rubric. Um, the only difference really between um, what you saw on the previous screen and this screen is the two criteria at the bottom there that we've appended for how we're approaching the visual communication. Um, but that, I think, is an entirely different webinar altogether. Okay, what are the next steps? <laughs> We as a group would be looking at the assignment parameters that we've outlined here and plus to those of you who are interested in participating in the Texas Assessment Collaborative will be working with us to make sure that we refine our parameters for our assignments that we'll be collecting to get them as refined as possible and as clear as possible. Um, then we will, by the end of the spring semester, finalize those assignment parameters and have them ready for everyone who uh, wishes to participate in the, in the process. If you're interested in the Texas Assessment Collaborative or any of the other things that you heard about today, uh, like GEMS, uh, you probably are familiar with HIPS already, uh, DQP and tuning. There are resources available at the Texas uh, website. Uh, you can go there and if you click on the development hub you will find information on all of those uh, projects uh, there. Also there's information at the NILOA website. If you're interested in looking at assignments that NILOA has uh, worked on with uh, faculty and developed uh, over time through the charrette process, you can find those assignments in the NIOLA assignment library. All right, questions and answers. Um, again, if you have a question that you need to uh, ask, you can just type it in the box down at the bottom. You could probably also unmute yourself and ask a question as well. We did have one question that came in that asked the question, in terms of independent work, would peer-reviewed essays not meet the individual authorship requirement? Um, my response to that was, uh, if they are peer-reviewed, reviewed by other students, but they are individually authored, then they should meet the uh, requirement of being individual authors. Uh, Chris, would you agree with that? Yeah, and I, I had alluded to that earlier, and I think I'd answer, but I think it went through as a private response, is that the peer review work does not, I don't think, present an, uh, an issue for authorship because that's that peer review is part of the writing process, and ultimately that individual student is still responsible and is considered the sole author of that final document. That's, I don't think that presents an issue at all. That's very different from the documents that would be a concern, and that would be documents in which different sections were written by different students. Any other questions? Chris, you might open it up so that folks, if they want to talk, could. Uh, let's see. I think, I don't think I have it tied down. Okay, so if you want to unmute yourself and um, ask a question, you could do that. Or if you want to type one in at the bottom, you can do that also. Yeah, and while we're waiting on a question to come in, I'll add um, real quick. Karen was talking about the that speech assignment that they had developed. 
Um, with when we talk about the length of the documents, I, we're not with those parameters. We're not suggesting that to participate in the Texas Assessment Collaborative, that if you're collecting a document or an assignment, it has to be from an assignment where the student was told you have to write 750 words or three pages. Um, I think Karen uh, addressed it perfectly. Is that look, they've designed that assignment such that they would expect that the student is going to write at least three pages. That's all that's needed in terms of the parameters. Um, the issue that we were running into and have run into, uh, I, I think the concern is where um, if the assignment's designed such that the student's going to write one page, those are the types of assignments that we don't want. I don't think you necessarily have to say, tell students, oh, write this much but not this much. Um, that, I, I agree with you, Chris. This is Karen again. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we've had the same experience, and you and I uh, operate uh, similarly at our institutions. Uh, we've had it where you know, people turn in a few lines for an assessment piece, and obviously that doesn't work. So you do think of the minimum. But uh, also, uh, as a faculty member, and I'm sure many of you who have taught, you've probably had this experience where students, you tell them something, and then they'll do a word count, and somehow they become preoccupied with, i got to get these, these many words, these many words, you know, or this length, right? As opposed to, we really need you to focus on the development part of it, not just that. And, and, and I think that if we can get students trained with the development part of the work, that we'll, we will meet our word count. Also with faculty, because faculty, you know, and particularly those who are not used to teaching writing, some of them have struggled with, well, how am I supposed to have them do this in the context of this particular course, right? And if we can get them to thinking about, well, you still want them to have a well-developed, in this case we're talking about an essay, but even if it's a full research paper or, or what have you, you want to try to get people and reminding them, really reminding them of what we already know they've been exposed to. We know that they've already been exposed to, you know, the opening paragraph and the mighty middle and all that stuff since, what, third grade? <laughs> and, and so sometimes you just have to go back and, and remind them to do it. So that was our own, only thing there. I do totally agree with you, Chris, but I wasn't saying it um, in, in, any, any, in any other way other than recognizing that for, for us, even for some of our students, when we give them the word count or the pages, that becomes their preoccupation and as opposed to the focus on the, you know, format and technique and organization and development, all those things that are really important to writing as well. No, absolutely. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions? If there are no more questions, I would remind you that uh, the sampling, we're going to have a couple more webinars coming up soon. Sampling plan webinar is on Monday, April the 11th. Um, and then the IRB and institutional approval webinar is coming up on Tuesday, April the 26th. Pay attention to the fact that Monday, April the 11th, most of these have been on Tuesday, but this one is going to be on Monday, April the 11th. And again, if you uh, need to get in touch with us, please uh, feel free to contact either uh, Chris or myself. Uh, and you can also find more information, again, at the LEAP Texas website. Uh, thank you all for participating today.